Uh, thank you, Guillaume, for the introduction. Uh, so first, uh, as Jonas said, it's a pleasure to be able to present uh, my work. And uh, so without any further ado, I will uh, speak about uh, a joint work with uh, Mark Waters. And so this is based on a paper which is published in uh, Cypress Physics. So I put uh, physics in red because uh, it is a paper in physics. And uh, but at the same time, there are three mathematicians who have worked exactly on the same uh, topic. They have done exactly the same construction, but from a mathematical point of view. And uh, but the two papers are very different. And uh, in particular, uh, our construction really uh, rely on what I, an object called the Markov Klein transform, while uh, they study uh, other aspects of uh, the same uh, construction. So uh, my presentation, I will spend a bit of time uh, uh, recalling uh, what is free probability and uh, the link with uh, spherical integrals. Then I will uh, present the, um, how to use these uh, tools to construct the, the, an, an interpolation between the classical and the free convolution. And I will conclude with just two slides on uh, the, some remarkable link with what is called the finite free convolution, which has been studied by Adam Marcus. Uh, very recently. So uh, let me just uh, recall what is uh, free probability. So, so first I will discuss just the abstract setting just once. So you are giving a non-commutative uh, probability uh, space and uh, you have two operators A and B. And what you ask is the following, can I compute all the mixed moment because it's non-commutative there is, uh, you need to A, A square B is different than A, B, A from the knowledge of the moment of A and B separately. So that's a, the abstract question. And it turns out that there is, so what in spirit, what you are doing is uh, you are trying to make sense of the joint law of A and B, trying to express it in terms of the, of the law of A and the law of B. And uh, it turns out that there is, a, there is an underlying structure, which is called the freeness, where you can actually uh, do such things. And uh, in this case, we say that the two uh, operators are free. So that's the abstract setup, but you can, uh, there is a very concrete uh, way where you can observe uh, freeness is random, random matrices. So if you take two uh, random matrices and one of them is uh, randomly rotated, then what you obtain is uh, that uh, the two are asymptotically free. So, but, so what that means in practice that you can compute the spectrum of uh, typically the sum of uh, two uh, random matrices. Um, of two symmetric random matrices. So how to do so? I mean, you follow uh, what I call the recipe or in a sense an algorithm. You, you start by uh, defining the Earth transform. So the Earth transform is something which takes a probability measure and, uh, and a complex and it in gives you uh, another complex. It is defined as uh, you first take the inverse of the stages and you subtract uh, one over Y. So this is the Earth transform and the free convolution is defined the following way. If you have two, uh, two symmetric mat matrices, matrices and uh, you have uh, such, such that the empirical uh, spectrum distribution converge to some uh, compactly supported uh, distribution mu and mu b, the free convolution is defined as a unique probability measure such, such that uh, we have uh, linearity of the, of the corresponding R transform. And uh, so the matrix C, uh, of course, is a free convolution. And I use this uh, box symbol between uh, mu A and mu B to in the following. So, so to be a bit more precise, what, you can, what does it mean in practice? So uh, we'll show an example with uh, how to compute the R transform, just to, to see that it's very uh, easy, at least, for example, numerically, where, for example, I, I'm going to do the free convolution of uh, uh, symmetric binary distribution with itself. So you first compute the corresponding stages, then you compute the, the inverse, then you compute the R transform. The R transform of the free convolution is the sum of the R transform. You do now the, the steps in the opposite way by computing the inverse, the stages, and then you, you get the, the corresponding measure. So for example, for two Bernoulli, you obtain that the, the free convolution of two Bernoulli is uh, the famous uh, Arsene. Okay, and now you can define the uh, free cumulants. So you do the expansion in formal power series of the R transform. So this admits uh, uh, power series uh, 
the formal power series near the origin, and the free commulants, they are all the coefficient in front of, uh, of this air transform, and they satisfy uh, this uh, linearity uh, property, just like the air transform. But what is even more uh, interesting is you have a moment uh, free cumulant formula, which uh, express the moment in terms of the free cumulants as a sum over a non-crossing partition. So that is uh, the fourth moment of your distribution can be expressed in terms of the first four cumulants. And uh, the way to do this is to sum non-crossing partitions. So, so it just give you an example to, to make sense of this, uh, this uh, formula. So for example, let's say you want to compute M4 of your distribution from the knowledge of uh, its four equivalents. Then you draw the 15 uh, partitions of four. And it turns out that, that among the 15, there is one which is crossing. So you, you move it. And then you can express the first moment of your distribution in terms of, uh, of uh, all the first four uh, three commands. And uh, now I will uh, express so that you can also build a central limit theorem for, uh, for in the free world, or in what I call the free world. So let's say you have a, a, a sequence of uh, unit variance and mean zero uh, probability measure, which is compactly supported. And you convolve uh, those measure by such that uh, you do a change of a dilatation by, uh, by, by a square root of m. So that the variance goes to uh, as a one over uh, n. Then the limit distribution is well known to be given by the semicircle distribution. Sorry, the, the yes. circle plus is also the squared plus, or is the circle plus a different free? Oh, no, okay, no, that's a mistake. Sorry. Okay. okay it's the same. No, that's about plus. So that's important. So, sorry. Okay, that's a mistake. And uh, yeah, that, that's supposed to be yeah, this yeah. symbol. And uh, for the free poisson, you have the so you have uh, also a low flat or small number, so you can uh, do a Bernoulli distribution, where instead of uh, if you if you are in the classical world, you, you are it's a well-known fact that if you sum Bernoulli distribution, where the probability of success grows extremely like as one over n, and you sum n of them, then uh, you get the poisson distribution. But in the free probability world, uh, you have a similar construction, and you get the marching co and you have this uh, table of correspondence between the two. So you replace uh, the notion of independence in the, in the classical world as the notion of finesse in the, the non commutative probability world. And you replace classical convolution with free convolution. So, what I want to insist on is um, you can really think of uh, free convolution without the knowledge of finesse. It's uh, just an algorithm like the one. Uh, when I presented the example with the Bernoulli distribution, which take two inputs and give you as an output uh, another distribution. And uh, for example, uh, uh, as in the classical world, you don't need to have a probability to define uh, the, what is the convolution of two function. It turns out that this gives you a, a setting where uh, you know that the output is going to be a probability measure. And also you have also a combinatorial formula in both cases. Where for one case it's the sum over all partitions between the moment and the cumulants, and the other case it's the sum over non crossing partitions. So, because we have these two settings, we can, uh, we can do two uh, different operations uh, for, uh, for two measures. You can either do the classical convolution or the free convolution. And now, the goal of uh, this talk is to do a, a, to try to make an interpolation between the two. That is, to find a uh, an operation which takes two measure and another parameter c. And wh when I uh, make this parameter c uh, goes from one wedge to another, I interpolate between uh, the two uh, the two uh, convolutions. Yes. Okay. So, is there, you just want an interpolation, or you want some additional properties? Because imagine that there may be many interpolations. No. Uh, yeah. No. It's a very it's a very hard problem to to find something which for every, for so I'm not speaking of just this specific measure, but for any uh, pairs of uh, two uh, probability measure gives uh, another probability measures. Because there is a work by uh, Spicer on uh, independence. And it basically say that the underlying structure of, uh, of where you can do such things in a commutative space, there is just a finesse, uh, independence, and uh, three other types of independence, Boolean, uh, 
monotone and so on. But it's usually a hard problem to 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 construct such an operation. If that is, is it okay? Uh, okay. And so, if you have some motivation for, so why do we want to do this first? So there is actually some motivation in the the mathematical literature, but um, I would just. Uh, so they are related to representation theory of uh, infinite groups and, and in particular the symmetric groups. And uh, as I mentioned just before, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a difficult problem to construct a generalized generalized notion of uh, independence. But there are also some uh, some well-known work of uh, objects which interpolates between the classical object and the random matrix object. So, for example, if you take uh, the Dyson Bonan motion at high temperature, where instead of beta over two, you take now beta to scale as one over n. Then you, you can look at the stationary measure of this process. And as n goes to infinity, it goes to a distribution which is known as the SK Winkerov distribution. So it's as a name, but more importantly, it's continuously um, interpolates between the Gaussian and the semicircle distribution as you vary this uh, parameter uh, C. And uh, similarly, there are other constructions. So for example, you can take a look at the three diagonal random uh, matrices. So that's a construction by uh, Edelman. And uh, where there is a parameter beta, but now if you scale beta as uh, C uh, over N, then you have similarly uh, a similar construction where uh, the same distribution, so the exact same distribution appears and is uh, it is the interpolation between the Gaussian and the semicircle distribution. So um, if you have now, when you see something interpolating between the two, it means that, that probably there is an underlying uh, central limit theorem behind uh, behind all this. And uh, there are other way where you can do some similar construction by by uh, interpolating between, for example, the gamma and the Marchenko Pasteur distribution. And now, uh, so that was the first um, the first part where I represented the basic aspects of uh, probability in a, in a concise uh, way. But now I will move to uh, what are spherical integrals and how are they are related to um, to uh, free probability. So to first uh, to start, I just need to uh, I will start just as if I was going to do the Fourier transform of my L matrix A. And uh, if I want to do a Fourier transform or, uh, or a Laplace transform, I, I define a conjugate variable t. I do the scalar product uh, between the two. I take the exponential and then I would average over the law of A. That would have defined the, the Fourier transform, but here instead, I'm going to define uh, the, the, I'm going to randomly rotate t. I'm introducing another an orthogonal matrix, which I, here I call it G, and I'm going to do the uniform average over this uh, this matrix. So this is a, a well-known object called the Arishandra isaacson zuber integral, and you can define for uh, for uh, over real uh, over the real field. So for orthogonal matrices and symmetric, uh, so it's an average over orthogonal matrices, and the A is then uh, symmetric matrices. Or you can also define it for uh, Hermitian matrices. And uh, then you have uh, here G will be the unitary group. So it's, uh, so it's a well studied object. So, both in the mathematical and the physics literature, it has a deep relation with, for example, enumerative ge geometry. At beta equal to, there is a, a famous uh, determinantal formula for this object. But what I want to insist here is. You can see from this formula just by doing a change of variable. So if you go to the to to a from its eigenvalue, which I call by small of a, then this um, this uh, quantity only depends on uh, the eigenvalue of a and t. So that's a it will be the first property I will use on this integral, and then I define. So, okay, so first I will uh, ask what is the large n limit of this object. So, this is also a, a quite a well studied uh, topic. And it turns out that the correct scaling it depends on the rank of uh, the conjugate matrix. So if uh, it's for rank 
which is um, I will not speak uh, about in the, the the rest of the talk. Then it satisfies a very complex variational principle, which was first discovered in the physics literature by Matizin. And on the, in, on the other end, if it's a small rank, then it's related to a free probability transform. And this is uh, what I'm going to uh, to discuss more uh, in the following. So for example, let's take a look at the rank one case. In this case, as a spherical integral, this is a spherical integral uh, where I take the, the, ma the matrix, the conjugate matrix T to be rank one. So, uh, and I call theta the norm of uh, the, this, uh, or the non zero eigenvalue value of this rank one matrices, this rank one matrix. And now, uh, I now if you do just, uh, you can re-express this, uh, HCZ integral as an integral over the complex or real sphere, depending on if you are considering uh, symmetric or emission matrices. And you take uh, this form, so it's a, you, you take a uniform, uh, a uniform average of the, of the complex or real sphere of uh, this uh, exponential of uh, this theta times the convex combination of uh, the AI. So this defines uh, the spherical integral. And if you are from the physics literature, here you recognize uh, the partition function of what is called uh, the, the spherical Schrödinger Kirchhoff model. So that's uh, a remark, but nevertheless, it's uh, worth mentioning. And then, the, why I'm interested in this object is because it's related to the F transform in the large n limits. So if you take uh, the parameter uh, theta to be to be fixed. And that's close enough to the origin, and, and you take your matrix, uh, your, ma your diagonal matrix A to converge to some uh, compactly supported mu uh, A. Then you do some rescaling by n, uh, n beta over 2, and what you obtain is that the log of uh, this uh, spherical integral is related to the air transform. So that's, uh, that's the first, uh, so that's a very important result. So there is an idea of the proof, but I won't discuss it. And uh, that's a very important part. So it's uh, so log of the spherical transform at uh, large n, there are uh, nothing else than the air transform, which linearizes the uh, free, uh, free convolution. That's uh, the, the, the result I, I needed. Uh, and now I can try to build my uh, interpolation between the, the two convolutions. And uh, but for this, I first need to ex extend the spherical integral to all value of beta. So there, I could, I could have, uh, I can give you the results directly, but maybe it's, it's worth mentioning uh, to have some intuitions on how to build these results. So let's start with, uh, so the problem with, with uh, the, the, this construction is we have uh, an average over the field, which is uh, either a real in beta equal one, complex in beta equal two, or quaternionic in uh, beta equal four. And then uh, you want to have a, uh, to have an expression where this uh, you will remove the field and uh, you have uh, just where the parameter beta will, uh, will appear naturally. So for example, let's look at beta equal two. Then uh, that's just the definition of uh, the spherical integral in beta equal two. And uh, you see that it only depends on the square of the real part and the square of the imaginary parts. So when you see this, you are very, what you want to do is, well, if you want to go to the real sphere, is you do the polar charge not coordinate. So you, you say that this quantity here, it's uh, the square of a new variable, which I call the, again, sigma, sigma E square. And, um, and when you do so, you, you have represented your, your integral. Uh, you can represent your integral as an integral over the real sphere. So that's what I want to say. You have, uh, but you have a change of uh, variable. You have a Jacobian from this change of, uh, of variable and this Jacobian is uh, it's this measure. So, so you, have, uh, you have traded the fact that it's uh, on the complex sphere. Uh, so it's uniform in the complex sphere. Now it's uh, non-uniform, but on the real sphere. And uh, you can do the same construction for beta equal four, except now this change of variable is different. And you will obtain an, another non-uniform density with a different exponent uh, over the real sphere. So, 
maybe uh, this is not enough convincing for you, but what I argue is you can define the same, the analytical conti continuation of this for any beta by taking the real sphere. And now you introduce what I call the um, uh, spherical directly uh, distribution. So you are not uh, averaging uniformly over the sphere, but you privilege some direction depending on the parameter beta. So beta equal one, this is uniform. And when you increase beta, you are, uh, you are, uh, you are, uh, you are uh, favorizing some direction uh, far from the polar coordinates from the, from the, from the, from the coordinate of uh, the, your basis. And otherwise you are favorizing configuration close to uh, the basis of, uh, of your coordinates. So yeah, I think you might be able to. You, you explain the first uh, HCID for, uh, integral. Yes. And then, and then we forget about this. We just take t. Uh, yes. Uh, of, uh, of the first element of uh, A rotated by, uh, by G. That's the uh, Laplace compound of uh, G, A, G transpose, one, one. Okay. And this is the object I study, and this, this is this object, which is um, going to the air transform, not the full range case. Just, uh... Maybe you forgot to say that, that in your classical convolution, the Fourier transform linearizes it. And so for, for these objects, this 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 uh, this transform also linearizes it. So it has it has nice addition property. If you take this transform, if you take this integral for two, take the average of this integral for two objects, you, you get the, it, it decouples. This is this is a property that yeah, it's a, have. okay. So yeah, it's not one to say much about it, but if you if you do a plus OBO transpose here. And you average over all, all the uniformly over uh, over O, the orthogonal group. Then you would have H C of Z of H C Z of A times H C Z of B. I don't know if uh, the yeah, exactly. This is why we want to study this to, to define convolution. Yes. Okay. So. Um, so, but this is only defined for beta equal one to four because uh, we have uh, random matrices and we can define what is a real uh, symmetric random matrix, what is, a, what is a, an emission random matrix and so on. And now what I've uh, asked is what is uh, the correct way to extend this, uh, this notion to every beta? So this may seem odd at first, but uh, I give you some uh, heuristic arguments on what's going to be the, the final formula. And then I, I, what I'm saying is that's the correct formula, and uh, there are different uh, reasons why it's the correct one, and it stems from uh, the theory of symmetric functions. And for example, you can see this uh, function as the as the, um, as the eigen function of some differential operators, and uh, where there is, there is this parameter beta. And when now you take the analytical continuation of this uh, this partial. Um, this uh, differential operator, then you get uh, this function. You know if uh, that's so what is this operator? It's a symmetrized uh, Dunkel uh, operator. I mean, it's, it's related also to a uh, Calogero Moser or Sazardon operator. Um, okay. And okay, so I won't speak about this, but uh, this uh, type of, uh, of uh, so let me just say uh, at least one word maybe. It's uh, also related to Jack polynomials in the sense that if you do the now the formal power uh, series of uh, of your uh, spherical integral, but now for any beta, you obtain that the coefficient of, are given by uh, the Jack polynomials, and this type of polynomials they uh, they continuously interpolate between the so they are a one parameter generalization of the famous uh, Shor polynomials. And now what I'm saying is uh, the, the previous uh, asymptotic is now uh, valid for any beta. So previously these results where the log of the, of the spherical integral goes to the air transform was valid at beta equal one to four. And now what I'm just saying is it's also valid for any beta if you take uh, this uh, analytical extension of, of, uh, of the definition. 
So this is defined for, uh, so that's the main statement I want to keep in mind. And so now maybe you want to find something which uh, also uh, give you not the air transform, but uh, the, the, cl the classical uh, operator linearizing the classical convolution. So the, 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 that's a bit of the, so this, this is the formula for uh, every beta. And now if you take the limit of, uh, of uh, beta goes to zero, what you can see is that the, this uh, density, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a continuous with respect to the uniform density over the sphere for, for beta strictly positive. But when you go to zero, it condensates on uh, each of the cardinal points uh, up, to, uh, up to their sign. So if you, if you now replace this in the formula, what you obtain is just uh, the, the Laplace transform of uh, the empirical distribution of the AI. So I've just replaced sigma i by the, the, the cardinal points, but since uh, those cardinal points, when you take the square, it just gives you one, then you get uh, the Laplace transform of uh, your distribution. And in particular, now if uh, your distribution goes to, to, uh, to some compact, uh, to some compact uh, distribution mu of A, then uh, you have another asymptotic. So, so you have uh, so your distribution is now given by the, cumulant, the classical cumulant generating function, which generalizes the classical probability. So in summary, so you, you have this, uh, this uh, sketch. So you have the, the beta line. And what you will see is uh, if beta equals zero, you have the log of, uh, of this spherical integral it generalizes the classical convolution. And as soon as beta is uh, strictly positive, it uh, linearizes the free convolution when you take the large n limits. So this is a, a sharp phase transition. And, uh, and since our goal is to interpolate between the two, a uh, classical idea is to try to smoothen this transition by uh, making beta now going slowly to zero as a, with n. So if you, if you have a look at the previous example I have shown, Maybe a, a correct scaling is to take beta goes as a as one over n as a, n goes to the infinity, and this is a, this allows us to define the, the what I what I call the C spherical integral. It's uh, just the limit of uh, the beta integral, but in this uh, double uh, scaling limit. So well, now beta goes uh, as a, as a C over n and, uh, when n goes to infinity. All right, so now let's look at the, at how, uh, so what we postulate is we postulate a new, uh, a new operator, which we call the C convolution. And it's defined such that the log of this uh, C spherical integral is uh, in our exists this convolution. So that's the equation in blue. So our new uh, C convolution is, is a new way with this circle uh, um, UB. And we postulate that it's going to, to be defined so that it is uh, so that log of uh, the state spherical integral is linear for it. And now you have a very um, so that's uh, the statement. And uh, so this behaves as uh, the analog of the air transform, but for uh, the high temperature regime. And now the very natural question is to say, okay, the two endpoints are going to be the same. We are going to find the uh, a distribution which is either going at c equals as c equals uh, equals zero to, as a classical convolution of u and u b and as c goes to infinity as a free convolution, but natural but maybe there is some problem in the middle for an arbitrary value of uh, c positive, and you can actually show that uh, the um, if you define a uh, c convolution this way that it's a unique uh, distribution uh, with unit mass. But you have uh, it's an open problem of uh, of knowing if this distribution uh, so this is a distribution in the in the broad sense meaning that it can uh, be negative. Um, but it's uh, but it's uh, we we don't know if it's positive or negative. So this seems to be a bit of a bad news. But we have the uh, very encouraging results that it's uh, if some. Uh, Conjecture stemming from the uh, from the field of theory of theory of symmetric function is verified. Then this uh, 
second evolution is well defined. That means for any probability measures, uh, as I take as input, the second evolutions give you as an input another probability measure. So um, this is uh, in the following. Uh, I'm going to assume that this uh, conjecture is uh, verified and so that this, this object is also is also well defined. This is saying that there are no different coefficients for multiplied the set constant. Yes, exactly. But for uh, any beta, any couple of a and b, you can find uh, a, prob a probability measure over the m tuples, which which is uh, positive. Okay, um, so now I'm saying uh, the as I define the second evolution and as a, the, the second evolution, the question is how can you uh, perform uh, the second evolution in practice? And um, to do so, I need to uh, I will introduce an object which I which I call the Markov Klein transform. So let, let's uh, just look back before taking the the large n limit of. Uh, of our uh, spherical integral. So as I said, it's a non-uniform average over the sphere of uh, some uh, convex combination of the AI times the parameter theta. So if, if you can always express this as, a, as a, um, um, the moment generating function of this convex combination. So that's my X. So HCAZ is uh, the moment generating function of uh, x and x is the convex combination of uh, of the ai where now the the weights of the convex combination are non-uniform over the sphere and i call the markov time transform the law uh, in the high temperature regime where beta goes as c over n of uh, this uh, object this uh, convex combination so by which i mean if you take uh, AI to be uh, to go smoothly to some new new A compactly supported then the mark of time transform is uh, and when you take beta goes uh, as one over n is uh, the limiting uh, distribution of uh, this uh, this convex combination okay or is it uh, so it interpolates between what and what as c goes so as c equals zero uh, the sigma i they goes to um, to uh, one of the the point of uh, the card uh, one of the cardinal points. So this is going to be a to be a, a random permit uh, a evaluated at a random a random per permutation of uh, one uh, of m. So this is going to be in low equal to uh, to a mu of a. Is it uh, okay for the c equals zero? And as C goes to infinity, this is not defined because no, this is defined, but its uh, variance is equal to uh, zero. So it's uh, so it's an object which is uh, which is in a sense called it loses all the information of uh, your distribution. So if, if there are any other questions, I can. Uh, um, so now. The second evolution, as I said, it's, uh, I define it as a, such that the log of this quantity is uh, my linearism transform. So the second evolution, it has uh, the log of the C spherical integral is the analog of the R transform. But as I just said, this is nothing else than the, the log of uh, this quantity is nothing else than the cumulative generating function of uh, this, uh, this uh, convex, combination, uh, convex combination taken in the large n limit where both n goes to infinity and, and beta over two goes to, to some constant c. So what does it mean? It means you have a, a, a very uh, powerful way of, uh, of, uh, of computing the, the second evolution. You first uh, compute this, this, uh, the law of uh, this uh, Markov train transform for both mu a and mu b. You uh, convolve the both uh, the boss uh, density you just obtained, and then you try to do the inverse map. So that is, you want to, from the knowledge of uh, of uh, of the the classical convolution of new of a new a and new c and new, new b. You want to uh, you define uh, the second evolution as the inverse map. So and uh, now the 
how do you do we compute the marker time transform and how do we do we invert it? We need some uh, relation between the, the two measures in the the high temperature regime, which is the double scaling limit I've just discussed before. Um, and uh, for this, we can play a bit with uh, with uh, the expression you, you have when you take the large time limits and you obtain a relation which is called the marker time relation between the two. So this was the uh, first. Uh, so here actually by uh, Kirov, so the, and he named it like like this. So that's why we we have um, choose uh, this uh, this name, and you you see that you have this uh, this relation between the two. So on the left hand side you have something which looks like a Stigias transform, but there is an additional parameter c, and on the, the right hand side you have something which looks like the the limit of uh, the characteristic polynomial, but right as the power of minus c, and uh, so that's a formula and. And what is very important is you can invert it. That by which I mean, you can uh, get uh, an expression from uh, uh, either the initial distribution or the marker of prime transform from the other. So I'm just uh, writing it down. But it's uh, for for example, for uh, you can get the expression of the marker of prime transform for any C. It involves. Um, a non-local uh, fractional uh, differential operator with some boundary condition, but uh, I won't enter into the detail. I just want to say that we have a formula, and and we have we have also uh, another formula for uh, for the inverse of the Markov Klein transform. Uh, so you can uh, these are ugly formulas, uh, but what you can uh, the very good point with this is you can. Uh, you can they are easily tackled numerically. So you can, uh, if I give you mu a, I can very easily uh, um, uh, get an estimation of mu a by doing some uh, some numerical evaluation of the of this formula. And the same thing goes for uh, for uh, for mu a. So what I just want to say here is we can compute both the uh, both quantities uh, which are involved in the steps of uh, defining uh, the second volution. Um, and now I'm going to show some examples. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you take the Bernoulli distribution, uh, as I said, it's a c equals zero. This corresponds to uh, the classical convolution, and you get uh, three uh, three points at uh, zero, one, and two. And uh, the free convolution, you get uh, uh, the arc sine law. And what we obtain for different c uh, for our c convolution is. Is an, in an interpolation between the two curves. So, as a, when a, the blue curve is for C small and the red curve is for C uh, bigger and bigger, and you get a smooth interpolation. And actually, you can do this for a very generic uh, type of, uh, of uh, measure. Uh, of measure, for example, uh, if I take the uniform measure, the, the classical convolution of the uniform measure is uh, this uh, triangular distribution. And uh, and uh, you have also uh, the expression for the you have no expression, but you have a, a close uh, fixed point equation for the closed curve by the free convolution. And what you get for different C is an interpolation uh, between the two. And you, this goes for uh, many other examples. For example, I take here the uniform and the arc sine law, and you obtain uh, this type of curves. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about uh, uh, just uh, maybe in five slides or something like that. Now, the other thing I want to mention is uh, I want to uh, to ask uh, I want to define C cumulants. So um, you can define uh, the log of this high temperature spherical integral. You take its power series and. Uh, and you choose wisely the coefficient in front, and uh, and this defines uh, the the C cumulant. So I don't want to enter into too much detail here um, why this is the correct scaling, but what I just want to say is uh, you have a, a moment uh, moment C cumulant formula. So now instead of uh, summing over all partitions, you're 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 summing over all partitions, but you're putting some weights on the partitions. And the weight depend, depends on among other things if it's if they are crossing uh, or not. If they are crossing, you uh, you put some penalty over the weights so that they con they contribute less to the to the sum. And uh, at the limiting case, what you obtain is 
as c goes to zero, the weights they are the same for every partition. So you recover the the classical uh, moment Fermion uh, formula, and as c goes to infinity, the weight of the Poisson pa partitions is uh, is nil. So you are just summing over non-Poisson partitions. So well, what this formula says is actually uh, there is a also a convolution in terms of uh, of the moment uh, uh, cumulant uh, combinatorial expression. And uh, and now I'm going to ask what are the limits uh, theorems of uh, our C convolution. And uh, the first uh, thing you can uh, think about is uh, central limit theorem as before. So you take uh, you take a, a set of uh, n uh, n probability measure with uh, unit uh, variance and mean zero and the, you do uh, it's uh, the second evolution of this object, and um, so as I said, we first need to compute the Markov Klein transform, and then you need to inverse it. So, but as I also said, um, what it, what you are going to find is because we are obeying the Markov Klein space, you are just doing the the classical convolution of the, the Markov Klein transform. So. This is, is going to be given by the classical central limit theorem. So if you if you convolve uh, uh, n times uh, uh, some uh, fixed uh, variance uh, distribution, and uh, you will be scared such that its variance goes as one over n, you get a Gaussian. So what I want to say is Markov Klein transform of this object is going to be the Gaussian. And now it turns out that there is a very good uh, result by Kira who say that the inverse Markov Klein transform of the Gaussian it's exactly the askewin Kirov distribution. So in other words, what you get is you have a, a, a C central limit theorem where uh, the limiting distribution of uh, the central limit theorem is uh, something interpolating between a Gaussian and a semicircle, a semicircle distribution and with a fixed variance. So this is the plot on the, on the right hand side. All right, and then, uh, Okay, I will skip this. Um, and then you can ask the same thing for the C Poisson uh, thing. So if I'm now doing a Bernoulli distribution where uh, I'm, uh, I'm convolving it n times uh, this distribution, uh, what can I obtain? So you first do the same thing. You, you compute the Markov Klein transform and you try to compute the inverse. Now it turns out it's a much more complicated things to do. Uh, so you have uh, you have an ugly expression for the Markov Klein transform. It expresses itself as an inverse Laplace transform with some complicated function. And then you try to inverse this numeric. And then what you can do is very hard. Uh, and I think it's almost impossible. There is no analytical expression for this uh, for um, for uh, the limiting object when you want to do the inverse Markov Klein transform. But you can do it numerically. And uh, if you do so, what you obtain is a very uh, Nice curves interpolating between the Poisson the, the discrete Poisson distribution, which are represented by dots, and uh, the Marchenko Pastor distribution. Um, okay. And uh, then I will uh, conclude with uh, two. Uh, two uh, so, one very um, remarkable property. Uh, at least at the beginning with the second revolution. So they were looking at some uh, properties of, uh, of a random graph. And they, they were looking at the uh, convolution between polynomials so, and each monic and each with real roots. Uh, orthogonal uh, uh, distribution and uh, you do uh, and then you do the average over all the uniform uh, orthogonal uh, matrices this is going to define uh, a new uh, monic polynomial and what is very 
the very strong property is that this polynomial it has also real roots. So this is not, actually not easy to, to, to prove. But uh, if you do this operation for any vector of uh, A and any vector of uh, B, you get uh, a money polynomial with real roots. So this can be also interpreted as a convolution between measures. So you can define a uh, you can define uh, the, the, the measure associated to the roots of this polynomial. So, and this is called the finite free convolution of the, of the two measures. And now, why is, why is it called the finite free convolution? It's because now you take a sequence of, uh, if you take A to be a, a sequence, so that it converges to, to some compact measure on A, you, you do the same thing for B. Then the finite free convolution con converges as n goes to infinity to the free convolution. So um, that's what what does it want to? So what I'm saying is this object is the finite n analog, analog of the R transform, and uh, so not the R transform but the free convolution. So it doesn't correspond to the spectrum of the sum of two n by No, because so this is a, a non-random object. So this here, uh, this object here is non-random, while while uh, this object here is random. Oh. So, but uh, if you want, that's uh, an average over all the money polynomials. And if you do this, you get a polynomial, and you look at the roots of this polynomial, and this defines uh, this uh, this finite free convolution. I don't know if uh, is that clear or. Yeah. And um, because it's uh, you can interpret it as a convolution between uh, two measures, you can also define an analog of the R transform. So you can repeat the, the whole process. You can define uh, R transform. You can define finite free cumulants. What you find is the finite free cumulants. They also have a, a moment uh, of a finite free cumulants formula. So it's a it's a complex combinatorial formula where you put some weights. To the partition, and I'm not giving you the formula because it's a it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, long formula for the weights, so, yeah. okay. but it exists. But it works at every m. Yeah, for every m, you have a you have a, this uh, moment cumulant formula, and you have this uh, this last uh, results about this interpretation of uh, this uh, finite free convolution. So you have. Uh, the result by uh, Gorin and Marcus, where they show that in some sense we can interpret the, 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 this finite free convolution as uh, the freezing regime of some process, which is called the orbital, uh, beta orbital process, where the beta goes to infinity. So, what I just want to say here is uh, this is in a sense expected because if you take a gas of Coulomb uh, and you take beta goes to infinity, then, uh, but, but n is fixed. The, 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 the number of uh, particles of your gas of Coulomb on the real line, then which it's well known that this is going to uh, converge to the roots of uh, the orthogonal uh, polynomial associated to, uh, to your distribution. So in a sense, what they obtain is, uh, is uh, what you expect, but the following is, uh, is actually a remark uh, by, uh, by Perales about the second volution is, in my opinion, uh, not, uh, not well understood yet. But you have a, a duality between the, the finite free convolution and the second volution. So the finite free convolution is defined for every integer n, and the, the same thing, the second volution is defined for uh, every uh, positive uh, C. If you look at the formulas, for example, the weights on partitions, what you find is, uh, is that this corresponds exactly to, to uh, make an analytical extension of, uh, of the formula you obtain. But that's uh, minus n. So you, you take uh, the uh, so few slides before I presented the, the cumulant moment formula for the, the second volution. There is a, um, uh, a weight which depends on c. If you now replace the weight by just replacing the blankly by minus n, then what you observe is a moment c cumulant formula of the finite free convolution. So this is an observation. But actually, this observation is um, this observation goes uh, also far from just the moment cumulant formula. You have a similar relation between the finite air transform and the high temperature spherical uh, 
spherical integral, you have a, you can define something which is very which is almost the same thing as the Markov train uh, transform, and you have also this uh, duality of uh, beta goes to infinity for for finite free convolution and uh, interpreted as a c equal minus n. So this is just an observation, and this is something which uh, I mean, in my opinion, is not yet fully understood yet. But um, but this is what what we observed. And uh, with this, I think I'm uh, almost finished. I just want to to uh, conclude with uh, what we are, what I've been doing. So in this talk, uh, um, I try to and to define a new convolution, uh, interpreting between the classical and the free one by looking at uh, an object an object called the spherical integrals, which depend on beta. And then I make this parameter beta goes as a c over n. Um, uh, and takes the n large n limit of this object and this limit, uh, this double scaling limit, this, this is what I call the high temperature uh, limits. And uh, we have now some uh, open uh, natural question is try to find uh, uh, so this is in a sense a random, uh, um, this, is a, this is an abstract operation between two measures. And the natural question is maybe to ask maybe. Is there an underlying model matrix operation between the two? Can I, uh, instead of uh, conjugating by the random unitary or orthogonal matrices, maybe there is another type of matrices where uh, where you can conjugate uh, and do the sum and then do the eigenvalues and you get the, the second solution. And um, the same goes for uh, what I want to say is you can actually build the same uh, the same um, the same interpolation between the classical multiplicative convolution and the classical is a free multiplicative convolution, which is a, but it's another subject, and those are two topics I'm currently working on. And with this, uh, I thank you for your attention, and, uh, and my talk is over. <laughs> <laughs>
Can we hear? We cannot hear. I try to activate his mic microphone, but yeah. Can we hear something? Okay. I think that's fine. No? Yeah. I had, I had a comment and a question. Yes. The, the comment is about this, uh, this, uh, this uh, remark that um, uh, finite rank simplifies the, the integral. I think the, the, the first people who observed that were, were Marinari, Parisi, and yes. Rittons back in the too, yes. 90s. Yes, exactly. And, and uh, okay, maybe, maybe you, should, you should quote them. Yeah, yeah, no, you're completely right. I mean, uh, Guionnet and Maidage, they actually made the rigorous the, the, in the mathematical literature. The, right. After the, that, it was, it was reworked by. Uh, by uh, Alice Guillonet and uh, Milan Ma Ma Maida, absolutely, yes. My, my question was about this, uh, this penalty coefficient. I was quite intrigued by what you wrote about your, either your C, uh, C convolution or this, uh, this uh, finite free convolution. In, yes. in, in both cases, uh, if I understand, you have this notion that you may expand the, the moments in terms of, of this, uh, Car, uh, cumulants, free cumulants, but with uh, this uh, coefficient, right, that you call penalty. Yes, exactly. So if you want, I can put uh, again the... In, in, the, in the context of the large N limit of, of matrices, of large matrices, should I think of this uh, penalty coefficient as a sort of one of mm, something dependent on N, uh, something like uh, some inverse powers of Inverse power of n or n squared, uh, like in the topological expansion. Uh, okay, so what you want to do is um, you have c. So I mean, uh, so in the, in the okay, so let me just if I can. Uh, ah. The question is is whether this uh, this uh, penalty coefficient has anything to do with the uh, topological expansion. Um, so to be honest, I'm not very familiar with the subject. So you're, you're speaking of this formula, right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so this formula, there is no, there is no n uh, in the formula. So you have just a, a weight which depends on c. Mm -hmm. What you can do is uh, you can say, okay, now I can go back and, and say that c is now equal to n beta over two. Mm -hmm. What you would obtain is an expansion in one over n of uh, this uh, of the moment uh, cumulant formula. But I don't, I don't know if there is a natural interpretation in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, to, uh, natural, natural, natural topological explanation for uh, the coefficients of this expansion. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, the, the large end limit is supposed to have a, to, to select some planar diagrams. Yes, exactly. Some planar objects and uh, and then uh, uh, I, I could imagine that these uh, penalty coefficients have something to do with a sort of correction, correcting terms uh, in, in uh, introducing uh, higher topologies. Yes, yes, but, but what I'm saying is uh, we have already taken the large n limit in here. So this, uh, this formula in, in red, there is, it's obtained after the large n limit. And uh, you are asking if we, if we go a step back and uh, and look at the coefficient uh, uh, we, we, which are vanishing mm -hmm. and, uh, and try to understand them. Uh, to, so just to be, to be sure I've understood your question. Mm, yeah, okay, I had this idea that what you were trying to do was, was some sort of interpolation between finite n and, and large n corresponding to the, to the free probability limit, but maybe, uh, may, maybe I'm mistaken. Okay, maybe uh, Mark uh, wants. No, to... no, I, 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 I haven't thought about it, but, 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 but it doesn't make sense. We, we, we should look into this. I, mean, this, this, this. Well, I cannot hear. Yeah, it, it's a very natural remark. We, we should look into this, see if, if, the, if the topological expansion is related to these. Uh, it, it's possible. It, it does make sense. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but we don't know the answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for coming. It's really useful. Sorry, if, if I may comment. Yes, but sure. Mr. Octavio is mean sorry. Uh, it's because uh, I, I don't know, I know it's not very polite to, to promote my work, but actually in a recent paper, we did a genus expansion for finite free cumulants. 
Oh, yeah, I've seen that, but uh, is it related to the second volition? So at least for, for, for the- oh, yeah, okay. So, okay, so for the other, the other moment cumulant formula for the finite free convolution, right? Yeah, for the finite free convolution, we have exactly a topological expansion. Well, a, a genus expansion in terms of, of, of surfaces. So here, uh, here's the coefficient. You can uh, depend on n, and, uh, and what you say is, is uh, you can interpret them as a topolog topological expansion. Okay. Yeah, exactly. This is this is in the recent paper with uh, Jorge Garza Vargas and, and Daniel Perales. Okay. 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 Sorry to, to mention my work, but, but I think this is related. The relation. Okay. Is, is that the answer of the question? Then I guess it's uh, it's, uh, it's very natural. <laughs> Okay. So I have another question. In the very beginning of the talk, you mentioned the uh, several interpolations of uh, the diagonal model. And yes. Second topology. So, what was the relation to the object that you mentioned in the talk? Is there a relation between three pi the diagonal models? And, oh, yeah, there is a relation. So, uh, no, uh, so the, the relation is so you, you observe the, you take the, the same, the same uh, limits. So by which I mean, uh, instead of uh, going, taking beta, you take uh, now beta going as one over n, and the coefficient of, of proportionality you call it c. But then you maybe you should just say that, that uh, no, everyone that with these three trinomial matrix you can you can generate any beta. So it, it typically it's used at, at finite beta, beta beta. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But you can you can then do this limit in it. So. If you if you look at the spectrum of this, for so if if you, okay, so maybe I'm going a step back. If you replace C here by uh, by n beta over two, then what you would obtain is uh, uh, the, the limiting spectrum of this matrix. It can be understood in in the sense um, as a semicircle distribution is a large n limit. Now, if you uh, if you replace beta by by um, by uh, two C over n. Uh, what you obtain is something interpolating between the Gaussian and the and the semicircle distribution. And here is the same thing. You, you have, if you remove this part, you have just a Brownian motion. So so Brownian motion. It's uh, if you look at the you have uh, some uh, some um, some attracting force. So, so it's a Hochstein process at c equals zero. So you obtain a, a, obviously the the Gaussian as as a stationary measure and. Uh, and otherwise, the usual uh, Daniel Dyson Brown motion where the emitting uh, distribution is a uh, semicircle distribution. I don't know if that's the uh, answer of your questions. But uh, what, so what I would just want to say is there is this, uh, this limiting distribution. And what we just say is we can also interpret it this limiting distribution, not uh, the matrices, uh, not, nor the Dyson Brown motion. The limiting distribution of this, we can also interpret it as a, as a limit object of a central limit theorem. Thank you again.